Dr. Larry Griffith is a son of the soil of Trinidad and Tobago and a third generation Seventh-day Adventist. He was born to Dr. Fitzclarence Griffith, former chief staff, chief of staff of the Community Hospital of SDA and Mrs. Bernice Sicheran Griffith for matron of the same hospital. And I pause to acknowledge their presence. Brother Griffith, Dr. Griffith, and Sister Griffith. I acknowledge them because when I started at Community Hospital 24 years ago, that's when I first met them. Dr. Griffith, Larry Griffith now I'm speaking about, is trained in medicine at Howard University, Washington, D.C. Completed surgical training at the Brooklyn Hospital Center in Brooklyn, New York, and fellowships training in minimal invasive surgery and weight loss surgery at Montefiore Medical Center in Bronx, New York. Dr. Griffith was the Associate Program Director for the Surgical Program at the Brooklyn Hospital Center and practiced surgery in New York for seven years before returning to the beautiful shores of Trinidad and Tobago in 2012. You hear me keep referring to the beautiful island of Trinidad. We are very proud of our country. It is beautiful. It is still paradise in spite of. He currently is a consultant surgeon at Eric Williams Medical Science Complex, where he runs the weight loss surgery program. Dr. Griffith has long been involved in community outreach and health education and is the president and co-founder of Trinidad and Tobago Advent Professional Society, better known as TTAPS, which is a medical mission charity. Dr. Griffith is married to Selena Griffith, a registered nurse and business administrator, and is the vice president and co-founder of TTAPS. Together, they have one handsome son, Malachi Griffith. Where is he? Oh, there he is. Give us a little wave, Malachi. All right. Dr. Larry Griffith sees himself as a servant physician under the leadership of the great physician. I give you Dr. Griffith, Larry Griffith. I would like to begin with some opening remarks. I was invited here to speak to you primarily by Sister de Coteau to let you know about what we're doing in the organization called TAPS, T-T-A-P-S. And T-T-A-P-S, as you see our symbol and logo up there, has got the foot washing, something that we are iconically remember from our communion service. And why do we choose that as our logo? Well, we chose that as our logo because if you remember the story in John, at the foot washing service, all of the, the, the new church, the disciples of Jesus, were seeking to see who was going to be greatest, who was going to do the most, who was going to get the positions. And Jesus said, well, no, it, it begins here. It begins in humility. And unfortunately, the spiritual graveyard is littered with the bones of Adventist leaders and Christian leaders who've forgotten this. Once we start pointing towards ourselves and say, well, look at how many people I've baptized and look at how many churches I've raised. Once we start doing that, the devil just puts his hook in our nose and leads us out. You see the people who you see on TV who are doing the evangelism and you know that they're not teaching the right thing and, and, and what we call prosperity ministries and have gone off track. I don't believe they started off that way. I think they started off on the right track, but they forgot this. And now they have the jets and the big houses, and they've gone. So that's what TAPS begins with. I would like to give special thanks to Sister Vicky for inviting um, myself on behalf of TAPS to speak 
here today, and by extension, the leadership of South Carib Conference, Pastor Moses and company, I'd like to thank you. Um, the work that is being done will be done by lay people. We all know that. And so this organization represents just one of many lay organizations. And so all of you healthcare workers, I'd like to wish you a happy 2020. A happy 2020. Now, of course, understand, well, what I speak, I speak always from prophecy because I always believe that Jesus is coming in my lifetime. I, I firmly believe that. It's not the soon thing that we've been saying for decades. It's his imminent coming is in my lifetime, and I don't believe that my son is going to grow to be an adult before he comes. And if you were looking at the news just yesterday, President Trump sent a missile and killed the, one of the top generals of Iran and then had the gall, the temerity to come on television and said, I did it to stop a war. So you kill a top lieutenant of an enemy country and say you did it to stop a war. Okay, so if you look at all the news that's going on on TV, you'll understand that 2020 is going to be a very bad year. I'm not a pessimist. I'm a realist. 2020 is going to be a very bad year. And so I, I want to leave this message with you today. Um, if you want to survive in 2020, you better pray plenty, plenty. And so I'm glad that Sister Vicky has a very aggressive, ambitious agenda for health because we need it. it we, we are at the end of time. And so, as a result, my message today is called No Time to Sleep. Where did I get this message from? Well, when I was younger, I used to really like the spy and thriller genre. And one of the people I unfortunately used to really like was James Bond because of course whatever was going on in the world he was there to save the day through wits and, and gadgets and whatnot and as a result he always seemed to come out on top well the world is a dangerous place today uh, more dangerous than the movies even suggest and unlike Mr. Bond we have to do the same thing by not relying on ourselves and our wits and our gadgets, but relying on God, the Holy Spirit. And so I named his movie that's coming out next year. It's called No Time to Die. Well, today we're going to talk about No Time to Sleep. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your love and mercy. And we thank you that everybody here really does want to bring your coming sooner by doing the work that you sent us to do. And I pray, Lord that we will all be inspired to do a better job of that. It's my prayer for Christ's sake. Amen. We're going to start off with our uh, text for today. And my son is here. When he was born, I called my parents and I told them, my replacement has arrived. <laughs> and the reason that he's here is, I'm going to talk about it a little later in my talk, is health ministry is one of the best ways to get your children involved in working for the Lord. And so I've taken the opportunity to get them involved early. Okay, ready? Found it. Good. Stop. John 9, 4. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Amen. Thank you. He's going to turn eight years old on Monday. And uh, if you look in your Bible, you will realize that uh, there were at least a couple kings in Israel's history who started when they were eight. So eight is not too young. So I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Jesus said this at the Last Supper. And he knew what was coming. He had been working for three and a half years, and in those three and a half years that he was working, well, he worked nonstop, day and night, to let God's message from the Father be promoted to human beings in a way that they could understand it. But he knew that this was the last night, and night was coming on his ministry. And so Jesus was telling his disciples, I have to work diligently because night is coming, when no man 
can work. And we see that that indeed did come. He was arrested, he was taken, he was crucified, and no longer was he able to do his work. But before that happened, he tried to prepare his disciples for the same process. Because once he was gone, they were going to have to take on the ministry that he was leaving behind. Next one, please. And so he went out into the garden to prepare in the way he always, always did. Everywhere in the Bible it says he began his day early, before the sun was out, he went out and started to prepare for his day. And we are supposed to be doing the same thing. Before we start our day as health professionals, we are supposed to get up early in the morning and get ready for our days because we don't know what we are going to meet. And so he sent them to, 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 to set them to pray with him. And unfortunately, when he was getting up from in between his sessions, he came and found them sleeping, sleeping. And he says, watch, therefore, for you know not when the master of the house cometh at even or at midnight or the crowing or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he finds you sleeping. There are events that are going to take place in this world. And understand those events are going to take place before the master comes. And they're going to catch us. You see, if you think Jesus is coming far out in the future, you won't be prepared. Understand that the day you die, Jesus came for you. Because the next thing you open your eyes to will be his coming. Either the first one or the second one. Or I should say second one or the third one. Okay? So everybody has to live in a life of continuous preparation. And when you sleep, not physically, because you understand from health and you start that you must get your eight hours of sleep. As health professionals, that's difficult. But you still have to do it. Yes? Next slide. It said that he found them sleeping. And he said to them in verse, tw- verse 40, watch and pray. Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. How many of you have been willing? You've been willing for many years. Willing. You, you just want to go out and do what God asks you to do, but you just don't know how. You just don't know where to start. Yes? Well, TAPS was about that, and I'll get to that in a little bit. Next slide. Sleep. Jesus talks a lot about sleep in his ministry. In fact, he gave the parable of the ten virgins uh, who fell asleep. But you see, there was something different between the two sets of virgins, the five that slept. All of them slept. All of them slept. But the five virgins, even while they slept, they were doing something that was a little bit different. And I preached a sermon about this just about a month ago, which I can't go to in detail. But to summarize, I want to say this. The difference between the sleeping virgins that were prepared and the ones that were not prepared had to do with something called continuous flow. Continuous flow. Continuous flow had to do with having a constant connection with God, symbolized in Zechariah by the olive trees that were pouring olive oil into the lamps continuously. So it didn't matter what time they woke up, what time the events were taking place, they were always filled with the Holy Spirit. Compared to the other five virgins who were filling themselves with buckets of oil. Say you go to the grocery store, I ran out of oil, I go to the grocery store, I buy a bucket. I run out of oil, I buy a bucket. But you know what? When the grocery store is closed, uh, like on New Year's Day, and you need that oil, you can't get it. And so when the event takes place at the end of time, and you need the Holy Spirit, well, you can't get it. You have to be continuously tapped into Jesus, and he would be filling you with that oil. So the problem with sleep is that when you sleep spiritually, you shut yourself out when the bridegroom cometh. And that's what those five virgins learn. Now, you wonder, well, why am I preaching to you today? Well, I'm, I, this is the preamble to what TAPS is about because it is based on this that we have TAPS, okay? There's a principle involved. But Jesus said, watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. Well, what is watching? Well, we know what praying is, but what, what about watching? What does that entail? Well, we have to go back to Ezekiel chapter 33 to understand what that entails. You see, he gave Ezekiel a vision, and he said... Set a watchman. Set him on the wall. And when the enemy is coming, the watchman is supposed to say, hey, get ready. Get your swords ready. Get your shields ready. Lock up your doors. Get the children out of the fields. The enemy is coming. 
And the job of the watchman was twofold. They had to look to see the signs that the enemy was coming, and they had to prepare the people for the enemy that was coming. That is the twofold job of watching. And you will see that the watchman was held accountable by God. So that if the watchman did his job well and the people were told, hey, look, the enemy is coming. And they say, well, you know, we've been hearing that for the last 50 years in the Adventist church. And they continue doing what they're doing. Well, if the enemy catches them, God says, well, they die in their sins. But if they listened, you watchmen have saved a person's life. That's what we're about in healthcare. We are watchmen, you see? But if we fail to do the job, you see, watch, healthcare workers are special people. It's not that everybody else is not special. So if you're not a healthcare worker, I'm not saying you're not special. But what I'm saying is healthcare is a special gift that God gives. And it is a big responsibility. Why? Because healthcare workers are likely in a large percentage of situations to be meeting people at their worst at their most needy, at their most vulnerable. And as a result of that, they are more likely to want to listen to what you have to say about God. So that's what makes it so special. It's not about us. It's about who we are meeting. You understand? So, when you are a watchman as a healthcare worker, you get to meet people who are likely to listen to what you have to say because they're looking for answers. Many of them are on hospital beds and all they're doing is looking up. Yes? All right. So, watching involves hearing the word, paying attention, preaching it, and living it. That's what watching is. And of course, the prayer that goes with the watching supports that effort. When God comes, he says, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according to his work shall be. Of course, the work that we do is simply the fruitful outbearing of what's going on in the heart. So we're not saved by our works, we understand. We are saved by grace. But real grace bears fruit. You understand? So when God comes to say, I'm giving you your reward according to your works, it's because if his grace was in you, you're going to bear the right type of fruit. And he says in Matthew 7, 21, that many people in that day, who in particular will be health care workers, will say, Lord, 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 haven't I done this in your name? Didn't I go and do that in your name? And he will say, depart from me. You didn't do the will of my father. We did our own will. We did our own thing. And like Cain, we tried to palm it off as the real thing. Notice what the virgin said when the bridegroom came. What did they say? Lord, Lord. Right? Just before they were shut out. And so that's one of the reasons why TAPS was created, as I will say again shortly. This is a very important Quote from Ellen White says, The great day of the Lord which is right upon us awakens neither alarm nor rejoicing in heart. That's lukewarm people, right? Why? Because we're sleeping. It is a solemn statement that I make to the church that not one in 20 whose names are registered upon the church books are prepared to close their earthly history. Not one in 20. That's probably about five people in this auditorium. Are prepared when God brings an end to earthly history. Last line, they are prepared. They, there are many who are unprepared to meet Christ. Why? Because they are not doers of the word. Action is very important in what we do. And according to this text that's next, the Bible says of, much, of whom much is given, much is required. Which means that if God has given you a great gift, you have greater responsibilities. And we know that not all gifts are created equal because Paul said, covet earnestly the best gifts. Yeah, be apostles, be prophets, etc., as opposed to those who speak in tongues. So, healthcare work is a great gift. Therefore, if you are a healthcare worker, well, you have a lot of responsibility. The bar is set very high for you to do the job that God asks you to do. And so, every one of us must be involved in this medical 
missions, medical missions. God sends us all to be medical missionaries. And this is another quote, which probably was said this morning. Medical missionary work is the right hand of the gospel. It is necessary to the advancement of the cause of God as through it men and women are led to see the importance of right habits of living. The saving power of the truth will be made known. And so Jesus said, I have to work. I have to work because darkness is coming. I have to work while it is light. And John 9, 5, he says, as long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. John 5, 39 says, search the scriptures for them. You think you have eternal life. They are they which testify of me. And Psalms 119, 126 says, it is time for thee, Lord, to work, for they have made void thy law. So what do I mean by these three texts? As long as Jesus is in the world, there's light in the world. When Jesus is extinguished from the world, there is... So therefore, our time cut off time for when we have to do the work while it is light is we are working until when? Until the light of Jesus is extinguished from the world. And the scriptures testify of the light of Jesus. So when the time comes when the scriptures are outlawed, the true scriptures, and the true knowledge of Jesus is outlawed, What has to happen next? What has to happen next? He has to come. So how do you know when Jesus is coming? When the laws are passed that outlaw the true worship of Jesus. Then there is no more work that can be done. Then it means that the devil has taken over the world. Then it means that Jesus has to come to save us. You understand? That's why David said, when they've made void thy law, it's time for you to get to work, Lord. So how close are we to that? Work till the night is coming. How close are we to that? Let me just show you this very simple thing. I don't have a pointer. I wish I did. It would make this so much nicer. But go back. Sister White says, and I paraphrase, that she set up God's people in the center of the earth, center of the world. And if you were to be able to look up At that map, over Africa, I hope you know your geography because I don't have a pointer, but over Africa, in that little dark square, that's where Israel is. Israel is in the center of the earth of the time. If you were going from Russia in the north or China, Russia to the north, south to Africa, you had to pass through Israel. If you're going from India and China in the east and going west to Europe, you have to pass through Israel and vice versa. All the trade routes would have to pass through Israel. And when you pass through the Israel and God's people, you have to pick up something. What did you have to pick up? Wheat? No. (laughs) Oil? No. You have to pick up some knowledge of God. That's why he put them there. Because you have to pass through the word of God on your way to your destination. You understand? So God's church began there. And after Christianity started, God's church spread out from the center of the world in the Mediterranean. And as the devil fought back, the countries out to the east of that became hardened in idolatrous and alternative religions. So now China today is Buddhist. India is Buddhist and Hindu. The whole Middle East became hardened in Islam, right? The whole north up by Russia is Orthodox Christian, which is just another brand of Roman Catholicism, if you study history, right? Africa got taken over by, everything green there is Muslim, by the way. Africa is taken over by Muslims. Europe, in purple, is Roman Catholic, right? Protestantism is the light blue. And as persecution followed God's people, God's people moved west, And I love to study history. And when you study history, you realize that God always protects the people, protects the country that is the repository of his people. Why? Because he has to protect his people so that they can give the word. So if you look at history, whenever Europe tried to unite as a holy Roman empire to stamp out Protestantism, through Charlemagne, through Napoleon, through through Hitler, 
Who stood in their way? In history. What country? Great Britain. Great Britain. They could never conquer Great Britain. Why? Well, that's where the Bible Society was. That's where God's main people were. But even Great Britain gave up that job and persecuted God's people. And God's people had to go west. And they founded the United States of America as a Protestant nation. It was technically the only nation in the world that was set up as a Protestant nation. And God's home church grew there. Adventists came out of there. Our general conference is there. So guess what? Look at, look at the, the map. What's purple in the west? The whole of South America, Catholic. Mexico, Central America, Catholic. Canada to the north, predominantly Catholic. Everywhere else, Muslim, Catholic, just a little bit of South Africa and Australia. And of course, Australia just lives on the borders of the land. So it's not even all that space. So when Protestantism and true Christianity is extinguished in the United States, as Revelation 13 says it will be, where will the church go? Where will it go? Into the Pacific Ocean? <laughs> Come back around to Japan? No, no, no. Japan is not accepting any Adventists. So where do we go? Thank you. We have to go up. <laughs> so how close are we? How close are we? If you look at the laws of Obama and President Trump, they're dismantling everything that the Lord set up in Creation Week. Marriage? Gone. <laughs> yes? Evolution? can't have Bibles in the school. You can teach evolution in school, but they outlawed teaching creationism in schools, right? Gone. So America, which was a Protestant nation, is now plucking out its Protestantism and it's starting to talk like a dragon, right? So when America finally falls, right? And if they impeach President Trump officially, who's going to be the president? A Roman Catholic, right? Pence. And if Pence is in collusion with Trump, and, and they get rid of him too, who's going to be president? Well, Nancy Pelosi, who's also a Catholic, who's kissing the Pope's ring. So, you know, there's nowhere to hide. It's going to happen, yes? Okay, so that's how close we are to, well, I just, second example, of course, is this one, which you've probably started to hear in your churches, that Pope Francis has asked for a global pact. Mind you, no other leader in the world can invite all the leaders and all the who's who of the world to come to his residence to sign a pact, except maybe the American president. Nobody else would listen. But he's calling everybody who's a who's who. Let's go to the next one, right? He wants to sign a pact of universal solidarity about a new humanism, he calls it. And you will see that Everybody who's invited is top of everything. Academics, education, economics, finance, sociologists, people welfare, human institutions, which is all about, again, the teaching institutions, international organizations and charity, all the business world. Everybody's been asked to come. Which is interesting because in Revelation chapter 17 and 18, when it talks about the collusion between the beast, the woman, and the rest of the world, it's a similar list. The merchants, the kings of the earth, the other churches, the craftsmen, the tradesmen, everybody who's a who's and who was in collusion with the beast. And that's what's being asked for. And when is that supposed to take place? May the 14th, this year, I heard it next year. <laughs> May the 14th this year in the Vatican, they're supposed to sign it, and he already has all his priests involved in education ready to go out into the world and implement it. What does he say? He says, in the current situation of globalization, not only of the economy, but also of technological and cultural exchanges, the nation state, that is actual independence of countries, is no longer able to procure the common good of its population. By the way, that word, com that phrase common good is very loaded. Very loaded term, which we have no time to go into. He says, and I'll paraphrase because I know that end sign is coming up soon, <laughs> that 
individual states must give their sovereignty to an overlord state that will govern the affairs of nations. So the nations will take care of the little things that they have to take care of for their countries, but then the overlord state will take care of the important things. And who's going to be the head of that overlord state? Well, you know who is going to be the head of that overlord state. I just put this up there. There's no time to go into it. But the Catholic Church does not do anything without importance as far as dates are concerned. And the dates that he made that statement and the dates around which this event is going to take place have everything to do with Feast of Mary. All right? So this is a serious thing. So let's go. Medical missionary. Everybody needs to be involved now. If you have not started a medical mission work of your own or become involved in an organization that does, you are running out of time. This is May. This is May. Huh? If you haven't started, you're going to be like the virgins looking for the bucket of oil and the supermarket is closed for business. When Jesus drops that sensor and says probation is over, there is no oil to get. You either have it or you don't. All right? So, let's get to what we do. So, my wife and I, well, thank you, it's over there now. So, my, my wife and I have been doing ministry for as long as. Before she met me, she was doing ministry. I've been doing ministry. I've always been involved in hospital ministry. So, this, when I lived in New York, Brooklyn Hospital, Adventist Association of Lay Members. This was my ministry. And in that ministry, I used to have meetings every week where I was taking people who were backslidden Adventists and studying with them and trying to pull them back into the fold. Oh, when I came here, oops. When I came to Trinidad and Tobago, we had to start a new ministry, and this is TAPS. We founded it in 2013, it is a legitimate operation. And we do pay taxes, and we are chartered with the government, et cetera, et cetera. And, and we started doing our work in TAPS as we continued expanding the things that we did away. And then we came to the point where we said, you know what? We shouldn't do this alone. We need to incorporate other people to also be involved. People who otherwise would probably never get to start because they just don't know what to do. And my heart went out to the physicians because as a physician going to training, I understand how difficult it is to find time to do the Lord's work. Except when the Lord comes, he's not going to say, okay, let's carve out the physicians. I'm going to deal with you separately as far as rewards are given because I understand what you're going through. And you were on call last night. So I'll give you a blight. No, no, no. God doesn't work that way. There's nowhere in the Gospels that says he has a stratified reward system. So I said, let me get the physicians together and say, listen, this work must be done. You must be a part of it. Forget that you have, you know, assignments for tomorrow. You have to carve out time to do it. And you have to use the talents that God gave you to do it. Because your responsibilities are great and he's going to hold you to a high level when he gives those rewards. And so... I got on the telephone and I just started calling people. I started with the people I knew and I called and they told me who they knew and I called and then I started having group and my wife and I would have banquets and we would, you know, have lunch banquets and you say, look, this is what we're about. This is what we want to accomplish. And our group grew to about 30 original members. But as is the case with anything, not everybody is going to be committed to the cause for various and sundry reasons, some that are legitimate and some that are not. And so out of that 30 original, we have 22 core members who I can call on at any time and expect that, that they will be there when we go out and do the work that we do. Involved in that, we realize, well, you know, physicians really can't do it alone. There are some things that we want to do. We have to have some nurses. So we got nurses. My wife is a nurse. My mother is a nurse. And so we got some nurses involved. Then we realized, well, you know, there's a whole spiritual side of things that we may not be the best at. That's not our gift, necessarily. And so we got in a couple pastors. And the pastors that came in are people who were just finishing past, uh, theology or just finished theology and we brought them in and said okay you're going to be that spiritual emphasis side of things the physicians that are in our group are also physicians who are just finishing training involved in training early in their careers and so what our goal was is to do door-to-door -door ministry and 
in that door-to-door -door ministry, we plan to do what Sister White said, take health care to the people and not wait for the people to come to us. Take it to the people and bring the message of the gospel along with it to the people. And so this is uh, an example of our group, TAPS. There are a few TAPS members that decided to come out today. Please stand quickly so you can see who you are. Even if you only made it to one meeting that you're going to come again, you can also stand. <sighs> All right? So we have quite a few TAPS people here. Um, our philosophy is basically God said it in his word. We simply going to obey that's what it's all about. And so TAPS follows the scriptures. So Matthew 28 says, teaching them to observe all things. So we teach. And we have health fairs. We have health lectures. Here is our, our, our physician corps, I'm sorry, our, our pastoral corps there who does the praying and so on when we go out and do our work. This is a, a picture of our health fair from last year, which we did at my office. We got a few people coming. Some more pictures, some of the physicians at work doing the job that Lord asked them to do. We also do a lot of work in churches. Oops, go back one. We have work in churches with San Juan SDA Church. We put on a whole day program of health education there, right? Next one, Jesus sa uh, the Bible says, pure religion on the file before God, take care of the widows. So we have a widow's ministry, and we give food baskets and so on to widows. Uh, this is the, a group of widows in Guyana that we've been supporting over a, a period of time. In addition to that, he said, uh, we have construction projects where we fund in situations where dire circumstances are there. So we had some widows whose houses were breaking down. Who uh, you, know, you look up at their roof and you see the constellation of the stars. Not because you're seeing the stars, but because there's so many holes in the galvanized. And so we had to repair their roof. Concrete uh, foundations falling apart had to repair that. And things like that, we've been helping the widows. Fatherless, same text. We work with the Rafa House, and these are some of the things we've been doing with Rafa House over years now uh, to help them out and the children, particularly involved in teaching them, especially prophecy, the Bible. And some of them have actually been baptized through the work of other church members and other churches. This is uh, Rafa House, and this is the team uh, as, that we did. Another thing that we do has to do with social, spiritual support. So people that come to my office, thank you, people that come to my office, we try to have our medical arm very entwined with the spiritual arm. So people come with cancers, all kinds of things they're dealing with. We pray with them in my office, okay? And we have a pastor that works with us. He prays with people in, in the office. So that's some of the things we do. Disaster relief, we help fund um, some families that were affected by the Bahamas, Dominica, hurricanes, Trinidad flooding. We were able to help out with that. Oppressed people in their families, lost jobs, can't buy groceries and so on. We funded uh, and purchased and taken to them groceries so that they could be supported. We do Bible studies every other Sabbath for people who come out of all these things and, and want to know about the Lord, now we bring them into the message by Bible studies. And for a year now, we have a radio program, which I don't know how many of you have heard it, but every Wednesday night at 6.30 p.m. on Sky 99.5, my father and I do a radio program. My wife and my mother are in support, and we've been pressing the gospel. We start off with a health nugget, just like the same routine, start off with a health nugget, teach them something, and then we give them the message. Our, cardin, our central focus coming up, which we've been working on for the last year and we're not able to get kicked off, is what we call the home health fair or mobile health fair, where we, as a small group, a couple physicians, nurse or dietitian, and pastors, go in groups of three and four to people's houses, put on a little health fair in their house. What we do, we just check their blood pressures, we check their uh, sugars, their cholesterol, check their weight and so on. And then we go into teaching on New Start, yes, and then we end with prayer and, go ahead, New Start and then prayer to finish. And the idea is that we will be bridging them, building contacts and bridges with them for the future. So in summary, Jesus said, who is least among you, 
who is to be greatest among you, let him be least among you. And you start off with this, with the washing of the feet idea. And there are a couple things I want to teach you as I end. I know it's at five minutes. Just a couple things I want to teach you as I end that you must know if you want to be involved in this kind of a ministry. Number one, great things can happen when you're tapped in. That's why we call it taps. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you plug into Jesus, the water flows through you continuously and you could do great things. If you disconnect yourself from the branch, you will do your own thing. And eventually, as he said, this father is going to burn that branch. Okay? Next thing. Next slide. As a vessel, as a vessel, we're all vessels, you're either filled with it or you're full of it. You understand what I'm saying? You're either filled with it or you're full of it. If you're full of it, empty yourself so you could be filled with it. Yes? All right. This is not about you and it's not about me. When Jesus says, come and follow me, like he told the disciples, they left their nets and followed him. There are things you're going to have to sacrifice and leave on the table to follow Jesus. Yes, you might have to give up a lot of things that you really want to do to follow Jesus, but it's going to be worth it because those things are going to burn anyway, right? There are no back doors to the kingdom. Everybody has to take up their cross and follow him. We all have to have our burdens and work, start working where your burden is. Next thing, he's going to take you out of your comfort zone. That's the only way he can prove your love. If you do the things you love to do, well, sure, it doesn't mean that you're loving him. But he's going to take you and put you somewhere that you're uncomfortable, like Jonah. Yeah, Jonah was a prophet. He could teach to the Israelites all day long. But when it came to Nineveh, oh, no, 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 that's not my comfort zone. Radio was not my comfort zone, but I've been doing it for a year, okay? Watch and pray that you enter not in temptation, and God asks you to do and give what you already have. He didn't say, go and give a bunch of money in this charity. That's not what Peter and James and John did. They said, we don't have money. Silver and gold, we don't have. Well, what I do have, that's what I'm going to give you. And he's already given us enough to give other people. And practice what you preach. How are you going to go talk to somebody about obesity when you're walking around like this? Huh? You, you're sticking somebody to check their blood sugar and you're sticking your own self to stuck. To sugar. I'm not saying that you're sinful if you're diabetic. What I'm saying is if we know the truth about health, we have to practice the truth about health. So when we go and tell people about it, we're not hypocrites. It's an excellent opportunity to train your young ones to get involved in the Lord's work. I'll skip over this for time, but I want to make, pay attention. Maybe one day I'll be invited to speak about this. Sabbath keeping. If we're going to be tested about Sabbath keeping, don't hide behind health care and say, well, I'm a health care worker. God said it's good to be good on the Sabbath. Therefore, I can do anything on the Sabbath related to my job. No, that's wrong. You need to look at your jobs carefully and see what you're doing on your jobs on Sabbath and see what you can cut out that you don't have to do and still do the good work. Understand? I, can't, I wish I could say more about that, but I can't. I, for one, have learned that on the Sabbath when I have to do rounds, I give out a book to my patients as much as I can. That's one of the things I've learned to do. So this is it. Work. For the night is coming when no man can work. And that means there's no time to sleep. Thank you very much.